Hello, I'm Bill Clark, and I'm an independent game designer. Today I'd like to talk to you about the development of my recent release, Craft Defense, on Pico 8. I made Craft Defense for the Jamcraft 6 Game Jam over the course of nine days. I was honored that Craft Defense was selected as the first place entry to the jam. I wanted to make this video for a couple of reasons. The first is that my series of game design principles videos about the tower defense genre were crucially important to the development of Craft Defense. I relied heavily on the lessons I learned from making those videos, and I'd like to share some thoughts from that process. The second is that I've had questions from a number of developers, including Bearing on the Discord and a number of commenters on Reddit, who are like, those are some cool ideas. Uh, how do you actually like use them? <laughs> Particularly when it comes to balancing, which is one of the really tricky aspects of tower defense development. So the fact that I now have a recent hands-on example provides a great framework to have that discussion. So what is craft defense? It's a completely free game you can beat in half an hour on Pico 8 or on itch.io. You can use gamepad, keyboard, or phone. So uh, go play it. I'll wait. The premise for craft defense came from the idea of making a tower defense game with a crafting mechanic at its core. Specifically, I decided to make towers out of combinations of discrete themed resources rather than by spending gold or mana like in most tower defenses. Before I wrote any code, I came up with the idea of each tower having several slots, each of which can accept one of a small handful of different components. Already I was presented with a significant question about player motivations. One version of the mastery motivation would lean towards giving the player free reign to choose whatever items they want. That would let players build the most perfect defense possible, and thus drive me to balancing the game to reward that level of precise mastery. But one of the dynamics I wanted to have was significant experimentation. I decided to borrow a bit from some of my favorite roguelikes, like Binding of Isaac and Hades, by giving random drops. This requires the player to be more adaptable, and hopefully yields excitement about chasing that perfect combo. In order to formalize this in my design, I added luck as an explicit player motivation. I also adjusted my conception of mastery to stress adaptable mastery, rather than some measure of absolute mastery. The next step in my design process was finalizing the set of slots that items can go into. Each slot needed to have at least four to six designed viable variants, with enough difference between them to interest players. Impact effects, including buffs and crits, were an obvious starting point. Particularly having recently analyzed Gemcraft for this channel, it was quite easy to list six or seven viable and visible impact effects. The next thought was adding some sort of AoE shape. I liked this idea to emphasize the aesthetic motivation, focusing the player extra hard on the shape of the map and on their tower placement. But the best I could come up with for a third category was firing behavior. Slow, fast, charging, ramping up were all feasible ideas, but honestly pretty boring. But I also thought of in a pattern around the tower, specifically considering shooting in a straight line outwards, rotating around the tower with each shot. That didn't wind up in the final game, but eventually led to inspiring the spiral tower. More importantly, it got me thinking about the firing behavior in spatial terms, and pushed my thinking away from a standard target and shoot at a specific monster behavior. Having recently played the excellent mini Metroidvania Metrash on Pico 8, the idea of weapons that only fire in one direction felt very interesting to explore. The zigzagging lightning tower was the first result of that, followed closely by the Mark of Yoro. Once I committed to most of the towers firing in haphazard patterns, regardless of the presence of enemies, adding in the flight pattern category with chain lightning, boomerang, lingering trap, and pass through became very obvious. I still implemented a targeted firing pattern. For balance purposes, this tower shoots very slowly. But as I iterated on the game and thought about the luck motivation, I decided to explicitly inject more luck reliance on that mechanic as well. Rather than firing at some predictable monster, say the nearest to the tower, or the closest to the exit, or the lowest health, I made the targeted tower choose a random enemy among all of the enemies in range. This made the tower explicitly more frustrating to use, but got it honestly more in line with all of the other frustrating towers. As I observed the possibility for frustration in the behavior of every tower, I decided to add one more player motivation to the game. I decided to focus on humor, which encouraged me to lean into the absurd and silly behavior that the game could produce. I made sure that every tooltip in the game had some sort of joke in it to line up with that desired silly tone. The flailing animation of the main squid monsters was also inspired by this goal of humorous gameplay. So now let's talk about balance. 
There are four item types in craft defense, a blue clock, a red blade, yellow lightning, and a white reticle. Each tower requires an item in the targeting slot in order to activate, but the other two slots are optional. For those of you doing the math at home, that's four targeting possibilities times five flight possibilities times five buff possibilities. So I'm theoretically responsible for balancing 100 different towers for every situation I present to the player. In order to figure out how to approach this huge problem in a handful of days, I needed to come up with some balance goals. The two that I landed on are, first, that every item and slot combination is above average for that slot in some circumstances. So that's four plus five plus five values that I want to have a form of balance against each other. I believe I largely succeeded at this one. The framing of this goal was important. I didn't try to make every item and slot combo equally useful to each other in some way. I simply needed to make it that there's some situation where each one will shine. The second balance goal was that no two or three item tower build is successful in all circumstances. This causes the player to need to experiment in different circumstances beyond simply when they don't get the drops that they want. I'm not convinced I landed this one as well. There are a couple of combinations that I've seen and discussed with players that seem pretty close to universally successful. But even if I didn't manage to fully land this one, it was an important guiding light for where I wanted things to go. The other thing I needed to decide was what tools to present to myself. Specifically, it would be theoretically possible to quote, perfectly balance for whatever that means, the game if every one of those hundred combinations had custom tuning for every number. Instead, I decided to make sure that each slot knew as little about the other slots as possible. In other words, I wanted their behavior to be orthogonal to each other. Ultimately, as I went through the balance process, I needed to flex just a little bit on this. Certain flight behaviors introduce a multiplier to range, damage, and or buff duration. But the firing modes and buffs could be completely independent of each other, with no more complicated logic than adding that little bit of math. The other decision I made was to have a tower-centric balance approach. I wasn't going to implement any particularly interesting enemies, so I basically just threw a dart at the wall with some enemy numbers and tuned around them rather than adjusting them very much on their own. So what was my balancing process? Once I had all of the slot types implemented and functioning, I created a test map. The map had four medium effective tower placements. I then tuned the monsters spawning on the map to leak an average of 10 to 30% of their number when fired at by two of the most reliable towers, the direct targeting towers. This gave me a clear baseline to start from. I set up a custom play mode that sent that wave repeatedly and recorded how many enemies leaked in the top left corner of the screen every time it went. I then spawned a bunch of instances of the game simultaneously across my monitor. The goal was to have any combination of two items, if slotted into the most advantageous of the four tower placements, yield roughly that 10 to 30% leakage. Different combinations had different levels of variability in terms of how many they would leak, but by tuning all the various numbers and after adding those extra multipliers for flight effects, I was eventually able to get each of the combinations into a rough state right around that 10 to 30% mark. I never did an explicit pass of balancing triple combinations. I think if I'd had another day or two of time, this might have been wise. Ultimately, I would prefer it if players were encouraged a little more to do triple towers, as they're the most interesting gameplay-wise. So making sure that the best tower placements actually reward clever construction of good triple combos would help me meet that goal. That said, anecdotally I see both myself and others defaulting to using a lot of triple towers, so I don't think it was a huge problem. So what were the pros and cons of this balance strategy? Importantly, it helped give me a psychologically sound way to move forward that gave me confidence. I'm not sure about you, but I find that actually about as important as any direct impact on the game. If I'm not confident about my approach, I tend to be distractible, avoidant, and less excited about what I'm doing. Thus, setting up a clear, rigorous definition of done for balance helped me jump fully into doing it. While the definition of done was far from perfect, it was good enough to ship with only a small amount of bonus balance later in the process. That bonus balancing came when I added more maps. At this point, the precise map geometry, wave size, and monster stats helped me hone in on certain tower combinations that were still out of whack. No matter how good my combinatoric testing scenario had been, it doesn't fully represent every game state, so I needed to throw away the idea that the items were in perfect balance 
and be ready to adjust any number that seemed out of sync in actual gameplay. This got very hand-wavy and relied heavily on my intuition to move forward, but having that solid starting point gave me the confidence to trust that intuition. The final level yielded an additional challenge. I liked having a very long path with a ton of places to put towers, and those placements wouldn't be very interesting without a high number of items to slot. However, that made it very easy to chew through any number of enemies by setting up the right AoE combos. Thus, I needed to add one more set of levers to my balanced toolkit. I added a multiplier to levels for monster speed and monster hit points. By making the monsters on the final level move 30% faster with 50% more health, I was able to present a significant challenge, even to a heavily developed tower setup. The other thing I'd like to discuss is some of the ideas that got left on the cutting room floor. I had a limited amount of time and energy to finish this game, so some ideas I was very excited about didn't make it into craft defense. I hope to do some or all of these in Craft Defense 2, which I'm aiming at sometime in January, fingers crossed. The first and most obvious cut is additional item types. Every item added yields a multiplicative result on the available options for the player due to the combinatorics. I have one item fully conceptualized, a green leaf, and expect I could come up with at least two more if I spent the time. Similarly, I would love to implement more monster and wave variety, including spawning multiple types of monsters simultaneously. I can imagine that there are fascinating, unique monster abilities that would play well with the geometry plus luck emphasis of craft defense, but I'm not yet sure what those would be. Probably time for me to go play some League of Legends for inspiration. Finally, I would love to add more ways for players to demonstrate their adaptable mastery of the game systems. The simplest would be reporting whether the player has beaten each level without leaking any monsters. Somewhat more complicated would be adding different wave and item tuning parameters for a hard mode for each map. Finally, I could go all the way to Gemcraft-style challenge scenarios that bend the rules of gameplay significantly to yield a more unique challenge. That last idea is very vague in my head, and might not actually prove to be feasible and interesting, but the ones before it feel like no-brainers, given the time. I'm super happy with how Craft Defense turned out. It is absolutely the best project I've made without a team of hundreds of co-workers alongside me. Thank you to the Jamcraft group for setting up the jam that inspired me. Thank you to the Pico8 community for helping me embrace limitations and cozy design spaces. And thank you to all of you who have been watching these videos, discussing them with me, and playing the game. Check the description for links. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this video and on craft defense. Talk to you soon.